In my previous lectures, we looked at the one and two dimensional perfectly inelastic collision. Hopefully, as you saw, with a little bit of practice, usually those situations are pretty simple and straightforward. We actually now skip the inelastic collision. The inelastic collision mathematically is a messy situation. And the reason for that is because of the certain amount of heat loss that occurs, for example, when these carts bounce off of each other. In order to perfectly describe what happens with these carts as they bounce off of each other, we would have to be able to somehow measure the amount of heat loss that occurs between the two carts as they're interacting with one another. Mathematically, that's a bit of a mess. So then therefore we skip over that entirely when doing basic quantitative examples at the introductory level, and instead we skip to the elastic collision. In an elastic collision, we consider the heat loss to be negligible. This is perfectly fine to do as long as the time of the interaction between the objects is short. So as these carts collide like so, the total amount of time while they're in collision is only a few hundredths or a few thousandths of a second. So then therefore, because of that, the amount of energy that's lost as heat is very small compared to, for example, the kinetic energy of the carts. This then makes situations involving collisions where the objects bounce off of each other easy to analyze mathematically. So what we're going to do here first is we're going to take a look at a series of one-dimensional, perfectly elastic, or just elastic collisions where the objects bounce off of each other and we consider the heat loss to be negligible. The first of those problems is going to be one of the strategies that you need to win while playing pocket billiards. So for those of you that are familiar with pocket billiards, you're going to begin to recognize what happens in the first of these examples. Okay, so let's go ahead and read the problem here and then start to work our way through the solution. We're going to break this up into a couple of steps. Okay, so two objects are going to undergo a series of one-dimensional elastic collisions. Find the final velocity of each object. Okay, in part A, the objects are of equal mass. We'll simulate that by means of these carts. And the first object has an initial speed of one meter per second, and the second object is initially at rest. Find the final velocities of both objects. So then therefore, we'll set it up like so. This right here and this right here will have the same mass. This cart will be initially at rest, and this guy here will be initially moving in that direction at one meter per second. They'll bounce off of each other, and then therefore, we're asked to find the final velocities. Now, when it comes to billiards, the balls in billiards all have the same mass. Think of this as the target ball, and this is the cue ball. And you take the cue ball, and you strike the target ball head on. What happens? Let's see what happens here as we work our way through the example. Okay, so we're going to take a look now at the one-dimensional elastic collision. Okay, the first of the situations that we're going to look at is as follows. Okay, so right here is a mass m with an initial velocity v1 naught of 1 meter per second. Right here is our second object, also of the same mass m. This object is initially at rest. And then the objects bounce off each other. The first object will have some final velocity either in this direction or it may rebound in the opposite direction. We'll call it V1 final, but it's unknown. And then the second object, still of mass m, will have a final velocity V2 final that's also unknown. So notice right off the bat, mathematically we have a complication here. We have two unknowns. This then means that we're going to need two equations. Now what are the two equations? Well, the first of those two equations is just our conservation of momentum expression. So let's go ahead and write that down. Change momentum of number one plus change momentum of number two is equal to zero. And let's just now start filling in our terms. So for object number one, after the collision, its final momentum is mv1 final. And then minus the initial mv1 naught. And then for object number two, its final momentum after the collision is m times v2 final. And then minus the initial, which is equal to zero, because the object, the target here, if you will, that begins at rest. Okay, let's go ahead and simplify the expression here a little bit. Notice that the mass m cancels, like so. And then therefore, I end up with the following expression. This expression here, where you can see that we have two unknowns, v1 final and v2 final. So then therefore, where do I come up with a second equation? This is where the elastic approximation comes in. We consider the heat loss to be negligible. 
So if the heat loss is negligible, the total kinetic energy of the carts before the collision is the same as the total kinetic energy of the carts after the collision. Here's how we write this mathematically. We write it as a conservation equation, conservation of kinetic energy. So this right here now is a statement of the elastic approximation. Change in kinetic energy of number one plus change in kinetic energy of number two is equal to zero. In reality, this number here is not equal to zero. It's actually equal to an extremely tiny negative number when you do consider the heat loss. However, it is perfectly valid in this problem to consider the heat loss to be negligible. Therefore, that's the elastic approximation. Okay, let's start going ahead now and filling in these terms here. So change in kinetic energy of number one. So after the collision, that's gonna be a one half m v1 final squared, minus then before the collision, one half m v1 naught squared. Like so. Okay, then object number two, final kinetic energy, one half m v2 final squared, and then minus the initial kinetic energy, which is equal to zero, because recall that the target is initially at rest. Okay, now the one-halves. The one-halves always cancel from a problem involving elastic collision. So the one-halves cancel out, as do the mass m's in this example, because once again, the objects are of equal mass. So let's get rid of that. Now let's clean the expression up a little bit. If you clean up the expression a little bit, you then end up with this. Like so, this expression here. And this expression here now is the second of our two equations and two unknowns. So at this point, you basically just have to do the algebra. And then therefore, in order to do so, you do so in the following manner. What I'm gonna do is take the momentum expression here and solve it for V1 final, say, and then plug it here into the kinetic energy expression. Always do the algebraic process in this manner. Never solve for an unknown here in the kinetic energy equation and try to plug it in here, because if you do, you're gonna to have to deal with square roots and you don't wanna deal with square roots. So let's go ahead and take the top expression here and solve it for V1 final. Okay, so V1 final then is equal to the following when you move the terms over to the other side. It's V1 naught minus V2 final. And then I'll take the expression for V1 final and then I'll plug it into here. So what I have to do is square it. So that then gives me the following. So I'm going to multiply it by itself, like so. Okay, and then referring to my kinetic energy equation, here are the remaining terms, like so. Okay, now let's go ahead and FOIL this out. Once we do it, we'll start to simplify. So this multiplied by this is like so. And then I have this multiplied by this, but there's a second one, this guy multiplied by that, like so this multiplied by this, and then these two terms. Like so. Pause the video at any time, by the way, if you have to catch up with the algebra. Okay, now let's go ahead and start to simplify. This positive V1 naught squared here cancels out with a negative V1 naught squared here, like so. And then what I have remaining is this term here plus this term here, so there's two of them, like so. And then this term here, zero, like so. Okay, I'm gonna do some erasing. Okay, notice that the twos cancel here and here. So when the twos cancel, I then end up with this. And now the only unknown that I have here is V2 final, so I can solve for it. But notice that it's a quadratic. So then therefore, technically speaking, there are two answers. Now, what is one of the answers? Well, notice that one of the answers for V2 final is zero. Zero minus zero is equal to zero. Okay, now go up to the top board once again. Well, wait a second. The initial velocity of number two is equal to zero. How can the final velocity be equal to zero? Well, let me ask you this. Because this is all occurring on a horizontal frictionless surface, the total quantity of motion, the momentum, is a conserved quantity regardless as to whether or not the collision itself actually takes place. So as a mathematical artifact, as it's sometimes referred to as, as a mathematical artifact in our quadratic equation when solving for one of the unknowns, 
in this case V2 final, one of the solutions that you'll obtain is sometimes referred to as the no collision solution. Okay, now watch how the no collision solution works for V1 final. So let's go over to here where V1 final is equal to now V1 naught minus zero. So V1 final is equal to V1 naught. Same final velocity as the initial velocity of object number one. Once again, that's the no collision solution. It's just a mathematical artifact of the quadratic. You don't really care about the no collision solution, but you should always look for it in the quadratic. It always has to be one of the solutions. If you don't see it as a solution in your quadratic, this then means that you made an algebraic mistake somewhere, and then therefore you can go back and, go back and check and correct for it. But you should always look for the no collision solution. If you don't see it, you made a mistake in your algebra. Okay, other than that, quite frankly, we really don't care about it. So let's just jump back here and solve for the other solution. In order to solve for the other solution, I'll go ahead and cancel out a V2 final from each term like so, and then solve for the remaining value. And notice that the final velocity of the target is the same as the initial velocity of the, the incident particle, as it's sometimes called. That is one meter per second. And now let's go ahead and finish by solving for V1 final. So V1 final is equal now to V1 naught minus V1 naught. Remember that V2 final is equal to V1 naught, so then therefore V1 final is equal to zero. So the incident particle ends up at rest, and the target particle ends up with a speed of one meter per second. This is exactly what happens when you play pool, as long as you strike the target ball head on with the cue ball, and you don't spin the cue ball. So now let me go ahead and demonstrate this. Think of this card here as the cue ball, or excuse me, as the target ball, and think of this card here as the cue ball. This guy's initially going like so at one meter per second, this guy is initially at rest. This guy ends up at rest, and this guy over here ends up at one meter per second in the opposite direction. You're already familiar with this. If you play pool, as long as you strike the target ball head on with the cue ball, and you don't spin the cue ball. If you spin the cue ball, then the situation becomes more complicated because not only is linear momentum conserved, but something else called angular momentum is conserved as well. But as long as you don't spin the cue ball, then the only thing that happens when you strike the target ball head on is that the target ball continues at one meter per second and the cue ball ends up at rest. That's your first strategy that you need to win while playing pocket billiards. Now there are additional sections to this problem. We'll get to those additional sections in the next video.